okay. Hello, hello? Okay, it's happening. <laughs> okay. Hello, hello, all. All right. Happy Friday of week one. Normally, I would say Fridays of spring quarter. What are y'all doing here? But it's rainy outside, so you've made the right life choice to come be inside. Congratulations. Um, okay, let's see. Um, we have a new Slido. I know Wednesday didn't go great, okay? But we're going to give Slido another chance. We're going to give it, it, this is its last chance before we revert back to pull everywhere. Um, but this will show up again. We're going to start off with a warm up. So hang on, I'm going to click. There we go. So if you remember, on Wednesday, we left off with this sort of comparison between the two different data structures, array lists and linked lists, as methods to implement the list ADT. If you remember, Remember with the array, that underlying array structure, you got to kind of make an array of a certain size and you fill it up. And if you insert, you got to shift. And if you delete, you got to shift to the right. And if you run out of space, you got to make another one, double the size and copy things over. But you get that nice, the indices are already in there. Versus linked lists, we're sort of making a node per each list, but it doesn't have indices. So you got to loop and count and all that sort of good stuff. So based on that knowledge, I want you to take the next five minutes Meet new humans around you. Be that cool person. See someone working alone. Be the change you wish to see in the world. I believe in you. And discuss this question. Write a data structure, write a, write a program that implements the list ADT that will be used to store a list of songs in a playlist. Now, I am somewhat assuming y'all are familiar with this mechanism of a playlist, but I'm going to guess all of you have very different priorities and use cases for the playlist. So things to think about. Which one, array list or linked list, is going to be better when you need to add a song, when you need to remove a song, when you need to change the orders of songs? What if you want to add that shuffle feature? Um, all of that good stuff. I want you to take the next five minutes, debate with those around you. What is the better underlying data structure and why? What are you optimizing for? What is most important to you when designing this playlist? There is a Slido theoretically open that will let you vote between array list and linked list. Can I get a thumbs up from somebody if you can actually? Great, it's alive. OK. We're going to give the Slido a try. All right, go ahead, discuss. TAs, please feel free to wander around and stimulate conversation. Raise your hand if you have any questions, and we'll come back together in about five minutes. Go ahead. Oh, hang on. Okay, take another like 30 seconds to wrap up your conversations. We're going to chat about it, and I'm going to ask you to dis. I'm going to ask people for why you picked what you picked. So get ready to advocate. Okay. Thank you, wonderful TAs, for giving me lots of options to avoid Slido. <laughs> we will figure this out at some point. OK. All right, so here is the secret to this. There is no one correct answer. But let's see what mob rule has chosen, all right? OK, let's see. Show results. Oh, interesting, interesting. All right. So now I want to know why. Like I said, I don't really care which one. I care more about why. Does anybody want to raise their hand and tell me why they picked ArrayList? Anyone give me a reason why ArrayList? Yeah. Uh, it makes shuffle play easier and the songs. It makes shuffle play easier and you can pick songs. And I assume what you're saying then is because it has the indices, you just generate a random sequence of numbers and you just drop into those indices. It makes shuffle really nice and easy to quickly access. A great example of why the array tends to be good is because that fast access. 
That's a lot of times why you want to pick array if you're trying to access things in the middle and all over because it's got that constant time lookup, right? Really nice. Beautiful. Any other reasons we would pick array list? Other things to add to our list of pro array list? Yeah. We noticed that for shuffle, uh, probably array list would be O to N. Mm. Ooh, I love it. We even have our class complexities. So if we did shuffle for array list, yeah, we would be running in what we call linear time or O of N, just like our friend said here, because we would generate um, like all the numbers between zero and size, and we would mix them all up, and then we would just touch that many things, dive in. So that would give us linear time, because it would be constant time lookup of N items. So we'd get N runtime, versus the linked list, if we were, say, generating that random sequence of numbers, then we would have to start at the front and count to find each one. And then we're like, play that song. And then we'd start at the front again and count to find the next one. So you're correct in that we would get that n squared or quadratic style runtime because we're constantly having to count to find which index we're looking for. Any other array list justifications? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ah, yes. So in this case, what we're talking about is array list is really well optimized for adding a new song, except when we're out of space in the array. But that's only going to happen every so often, right? Because we're going to double the space. So you're right. Like we get that constant time add at the back of the array list versus linked list, unless we have a pointer to the back, which right now we're assuming we don't. You would have to start at the front and loop all the way to the back. Great. OK, let's swap. Like I said, there is no right. Who wants to take? Who is our, who's our dark horse? Who's our underdog here? Who wants to advocate for the linked list implementation? There's absolutely justifications. Anyone come up with anything? At least 34% of you picked linked list, so yeah. Ooh, easier to add songs because we're not going to run out of capacity, right? And so I think in this particular case, and I really like that answer and sort of congruous with this, with the array list, it's really easy to add certain songs until we run out of capacity, which is good if we're not rapidly growing our list. If we were just like adding and adding and adding and adding, we are going to hit that double situation a lot more often. So if you're somebody that's like, you know what? My playlists are kind of always around the same size. They never get super big. We're only going to hit that array thing a couple times. But maybe you're someone that's like, no, I need an array. Like, I need a playlist that goes eight hours, right? Like, I am constantly adding and adding. You could argue that the linked list over time then might be better because you're never going to incur that extra double over kind of thing. I like it. Other justifications for linked list? Yeah. Uh, so I'm thinking, like, normally when you add songs like chronologically, I guess. Yes. Yes. So our friend brought up like sort of like, yeah, like maybe we get tired. Like I do. I always sort of start my playlist and it's like I hear the first three songs way more than I hear the other songs. Out of interest, if anybody here uses Spotify, do you ever notice that when you press shuffle, they bias towards the newly added songs for that reason? That's that algorithm behind the shuffle in Spotify for that exact reason. But our friend rightly added, you know, maybe you want to change that order a lot more. Maybe you want to take those things, remove them, move them to the back, switch up orders. See, I care a lot about the emotional journey that my playlist goes on. I am always tweaking the order. And remember, when we're moving stuff around, to move things around, to do an insert or remove in the array is almost always that linear time because I got to shuffle everything. Like I got to shift these ways. But linked list. Generally, we associate it with being more flexible in order because we just have to change those errors around. So in general, when we're talking about growing size, we kind of pick linked list if we're growing really rapidly so we don't hit that thing. Or whenever we're changing the order, we also think of linked list as a lot more flexible. Great. Anybody have any other sort of justifications that didn't get said that they want to share? Any other interesting interpretations of playlist? Yeah. Sure. Great. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. It's way easier to delete a song. You still have to loop to find it, but you won't have to do all that shifting and moving everything around. That's nice. Like that a lot.
What an interesting question. Because if we talk about it in terms of like operations, you could argue that they're both linear. That one is a linear counting of like following the arrows, and another one is a linear counting of like shifting values in boxes. And so which one of those is faster? In terms of big O, they are equivalent. We sort of wave our hands and we're like, those are theoretically equivalent. But generally, if you sort of break it down, we are learning a language called Java, right? But the Java compiler takes Java, which is pretty much English language. It's like human readable code, but it's sort of articulated for a computer. Computers do not actually understand Java. That's what the compiler is for. It takes our Java and translates it into a language the computer can understand. And it translates it often into something we call assembly, which has very few types of operations. It's just like and, or, jump, that kind of stuff. And so you'll find that actually in the assembly situation, following the arrows is probably easier than changing assignments. But it does matter on your system, which assembly they're working on, and also the compiler. That's a level deeper than I expect you necessarily to know, but I'm also bringing it up because, great segue, let's talk about one more aspect of code that we want to consider when we're thinking about design. So um, I guess just to sort of close this out, uh, here's my list of things. I think we all sort of mentioned these things, but there is no right answer to this. You could have argued either way, but I hope you're starting to see, like we want to sort of empathize with our user. What do we think is going to happen the most often? What's the function we care about? Think about the functions you're going to do and how expensive they are. You know, there's sort of always this trade-off between like, I want to optimize for the thing that's going to happen the most, but I also want to prevent the absolute worst case scenario. And so it's always a little bit of a trade-off between what benefit am I going after and what really poor runtime am I trying to avoid? There's always a balance, right? Um, so uh, real quick, here's my announcements. There's not really many interesting things other than I know so many of you already have tried to set up for Homework Zero, because shout out, I heard that a lot of people showed up at the setup office hours today. So thank you, everyone, for getting started on that. I saw a lot of posts on Edboard. If you haven't already tried to do your setup, please do it now. If you need an adult, the adults are waiting to help you. I use adult loosely because we are all, we are all mostly the same age here, right? Yeah, lie to me. Um, OK. And then I will also tell you a friendly reminder, we are going to start doing weekly written homeworks. They will be distributed via Gradescope. You'll like write them on a piece of paper probably and take a picture of them or scan them if you're fancy. Um, and those are going to start on Monday. They're going to go out on Mondays and be due on Mondays. And remember, I'm going to do an example problem in lecture each day for one of the four problems that's on your worksheet. So you'll get three that are essentially me walking through them. So that's my little it's nice to come to lecture because Casey helps you do your homework kind of thing. Um, does anybody have any administrative questions at this time? Cool. So let's dive back into these design decisions. So there's a lot of different ways to implement them. As you can tell, a lot of times what we were talking about just there was runtime, right? We were talking about the, you know, is it constant time to get to a song? Is it linear time to count up to it, et cetera, things like that. But that's only one dimension to consider when we're talking about how we design our code. So when we're talking about runtime, we're often talking about the speed at which your code is going to complete. But also, a lot of times, we also need to consider how much memory your program takes up. If you are writing programs for, say, like a laptop, um, you probably don't care very much about memory because we live in this future situation where you can have a laptop with like a terabyte of data, which is bonkers to me. Um, but if you're, say, programming for the web, you're, say, programming for mobile devices, we care a lot about how much memory you're using up. So for example, though the arrays each individually take up a little less space per element, every time we have to do that doubling of array and copying it over, that means we're actually using double the memory space for a while there. And there's also that sort of like excess memory that we're not using. So you might find that sometimes like the more right-sized memory, even if it's like less runtime efficient, might be the better choice depending on the platform you're building for. So how much memory space you're using, meaning how many variables are you holding? Do you ever have to make a copy of that underlying structure? Those are things to also start thinking about when you're picking your designs. 
Um, another aspect that we did not talk about in intro at all is this kind of idea about reusability of our code. Listen, y'all, I was an intro TA. I had to grade at one point. I know that grading on style does not feel good. Y'all don't like it. I know you want to argue about it. Here's what I will tell you. I think we're doing a much better job of being uh, less particular in intro now than when I was an undergrad. So I cannot tell you how much more intense it used to be, but style matters so, so much in industry. Because, like I said, like Java, C, Python, C++, that's language written for other developers, right? It's language written for you. And so we care about making your code readable. We care about it so much, we would prefer readable code over efficient code in a lot of situations. Because if I am the software engineering hiring manager and I'm managing my budgets, an extra 10 to 30 minutes of a developer reading code is way more expensive than the extra computer cycles it's going to take me to run code. So I care a lot about, is your code readable? Is it easily maintained? Can I reuse this code in other situations? Now, sometimes we don't care so much for this code. We're going to write it once. We're going to throw it away, especially if you're in the research section. Uh, my bestie is an AI researcher, and he's like, I never reuse a piece of code. I just write some bash scripts, and then we toss that stuff out. That's a whole different life. I don't know how they live in over there, OK? But that's another design aspect that we are always going to be talking about. There is no necessarily right answer for style, but often the right answer for style is consistency. Because we are all pattern matchers at heart, and so we like code that's nice and consistent, looks the same. It's easier for us to identify bugs. We almost always would prefer clearer code over compact code. If you're that type of person that is ever going to argue with me that your code is better because it's fewer lines or fewer characters, we are going to have an uncomfortable conversation, OK? Like, if you're trying to pack your ternary with so many different logical operators so you can have a single line of code, that is not how professional code is written, OK? Just like when we think about professionally written essays, nobody cares about the fewest words. We care about the clearest language. Now it's time to start thinking about your code, not necessarily of just does it work or not, but how well does it articulate your ideas? How easily understandable is it for the next developer? And frankly, for you, probably three months later, when you were really tired and you wrote it that first time and you got to come back and somebody issued a bug and you're like, oh my god, what was I thinking? Like, you would, not, you would be amazed at how often comments that you wrote are actually just for you in the future, that kind of stuff. So another thing to think about when we're talking about design, we're going to get more into modularity and how we want to break our code into smaller and smaller pieces. The more we break code up, the more it's reusable, the easier it is to isolate bugs. You're going to write unit tests. You're going to feel this pain, so I don't even have to preach to you on it. Cool. Um, and then robustness versus performance. Uh, robustness, I'm meaning things like, are we doing a lot of extra checking? Are we really protecting ourselves against every possible bad thing a user could do? Are we pre protecting ourselves against all the security things? Are we protecting ourselves against all the different ways in which other code could misuse or in incorrectly articulate our code? Or are we really sort of focused on just like as fast as possible making some assumptions so we can get through that code? I'm probably not going to ask you to evaluate all of these different aspects of code, but I want you to start to think about code in a different way from intro, that there's a lot of different ways to evaluate code. And we are, not, we are now transitioning from works or doesn't work to is it the right fit for my scenario? Because there's no right answer on any of these spectrums. These are all just sort of levers that you need to consider in the scenario that you're working on. So I don't have any questions about this list. Any curiosities so far? OK. We're going to take one quick aside to talk in a little bit more detail about how the memory of your computer really works. Because this is one aspect that this is deeper than big O. OK? Big O, like I said, it's all that theoretical runtime. This stuff would be equivalent in big O, but I want you to, for example, what I'm going to talk about here is you will probably find most of the solutions in industry do choose array as the underlying structure. 
Not for any of the reasons that we just talked about, but, but for this reason. So I'm just going to talk about memory for a little bit. If you don't, if EE stuff is scary to you, I promise we're not going to get much deeper than this, okay? So first things first. Memory in your computer is literally an array. It is a bunch of transistors. It's a bunch of little buckets that can store pieces of numbers, really. And each of those buckets has an index, just like an array. Now, the indices are not necessarily zero through whatever. They're mostly hexadecimal numbers. But forgive me, I put some binary up here. So these, you can imagine, these two arrays here represent spaces in the memory of your computer. Your computer has a lot of different types of memory. It's got the CPU, which essentially doesn't have memory in it. It's just got enough space for, like, give me the instructions, send it out. We've got caches. We've got RAM, random access memory. And then we've also got like hard disk, which is like for long-term storage. What I'm talking about here is that thing called RAM. RAM is the memory in your computer that like when you turn your computer off, it kind of wipes itself. Like it's got to have electricity to remember things. And it's the one that's constantly filling up and changing and doing stuff when you're working with programs in your computer. And so the way that RAM works is that you write code. You don't have to worry about this because we are using Java, which is a memory managed language. So you don't have to care necessarily about how, when you write Java, what you do is you tell the compiler, hey, I need this amount of memory. And then this magical logic inside of the computer, the operating system, is like, oh, you need how much memory? Let me go into RAM and find some extra space. And it's managing, like, oh, this part of your RAM is your web browser right now. And this part of your RAM is that video game you're playing. And this part of your RAM is your chat service, whatever. You don't have to worry about that as an engineer. But one thing to know is the difference between how the operating system finds places in memory to store what we call contiguous memory versus non-contiguous memory. The reason arrays are really special and the reason arrays can't grow is because it's this one big sort of like bulk order of memory that you give to your computer. So this first line that we've got here, this int array, new int, and then we tell it three, I'm telling the operating system, hey, I want enough space and memory to eventually hold three ints. So go find somewhere in that RAM where there's three int buckets all right next to each other. So you might want to sort of like represent it like this. This is also why reference semantics works, because we have one bucket to store the like variable name array, and it tells us where that array is. And then it sort of like sets aside that space. And it's like, other programs, you can't use this. I'm using this memory. That is kind of an expensive thing to do. But after we've done that, then to add in the three at index zero, it's like, great, it's right there. And then when I add in the index or the value seven at index one, it's co-located with the memory that I set aside. So that magical stuff that's happening with the operating system is super fast. It's really fast for the operating system to go find the neighbor to the box that I just filled up, so on and so forth. So once we've partitioned that space, moving between these buckets in memory ends up being really fast. I will show you next week some actual like graphs of me clocking the time it takes stuff to run. And you will see consistently that arrays just run faster for this reason, even if their class complexity takes a little longer. On the opposite side of it, linked lists, that's non-contiguous because every node is its own separate object. And it's that keyword new. Every time we use that keyword new, that's our secret handshake to the operating system that says, hey, we need like more space. But the linked list doesn't know how long it's going to be when it starts. So that first one, we make space for our uh, variable name, our pointer. And then we just set it aside enough space for that first node. When we get that next node, we kind of like know where to find the next, but then we got to go somewhere else in memory and find another little spot for it. Then we got to find another space in memory. And so the where our nodes are stored within RAM can kind of be all over the place. And like doing these jumps all over the system can be kind of expensive. And so you'll find that's why when we like literally stopwatch time linked lists, even if the class complexity is supposed to be equivalent, jumping around between the non-contiguous memory will take longer than the contiguous memory accesses. I know that was a lot of like electrical engineering words and things like that. But really, all I really want you to take away from this is arrays, bulk order size of memory, all we need all at once. And it's really nice and quick and fast to go between neighbors within the array. 
versus things like linked lists, we got to find a spot in memory for the little nodes all over the map. Does anyone have any questions about this? Curiosities, yeah. Yes, yeah, so in the moment when we need to resize our other array, what happens is, is it's going to have to go find a totally separate spot in memory that now has the space for double this size, and then it's copying numbers between those two spaces in the RAM, which is why that becomes a really memory expensive moment, because at that moment it's holding in memory all that space all at once while it's doing that copying. It'll free it up afterwards, but for that moment, you've sort of got double the allocation going on. Any other questions? Yes. Ah. Great question. So in the bottom array, we originally kind of had these like open spots of two, but they were sort of separated up. And so the question was, is the operating system smart enough to like move stuff around so they can make a contiguous block? No, not really. It will try to find it first. It does have processes in the background to kind of like clean things up or whatever, but usually that's not happening while the program's running. It's like when you close the program, it goes in and it cleans all that stuff up. Asterisk. The garbage collector, when we say the garbage collector goes in and cleans up memory, that's what it's doing. Is it's going into this memory spot and like erasing all that stuff and it's happening at a random interval. It's in partnership with the OS, so like we as programmers don't know when the garbage collection's happening, but it could happen if the garbage collector at some point came by and cleaned things up, but it's all about kind of timing and it's not predictable in the way that we write our code. Yeah. Uh, when you create an array or any variable in that case, uh, how, does the, how does Java know where to put it? So Java doesn't know where, so when you create an array, how does Java know where to put it? That's your question. Java doesn't know. Java says, hey, operating system, I need space for this many variables. The operating system knows. How does, how does the operating system oh, the, the yeah, so the operating system is like the boss of the memory. Like, it knows what's going on. Um, I know this is a very specific analogy, but I think of the operating system like Kumaji from Spirit Away, all right? Like, he's sitting in the boiler room, and he's got all those arms, and he just knows what boxes stuff is in, all right? Like, he's just moving around. Um, so the operating system is magic. The operating system lives in the memory. It knows what's going on, okay? Um, and that's why we just trust it to do its magic. If you are interested in knowing how it does that, you can take a class here called operating systems, um, which is really fun. Cool, okay. We will talk more about memory closer to the end of this course, but this is a kind of big impact on your runtime. I generally in this class will not necessarily ask you to evaluate your code from this perspective, but I always give this lecture and then people go online and they're like, Casey, everybody says that they always pick arrays. Nobody ever picks linked lists. Why? And I'm like, oh, this is why. <laughs> because people understand the next level down of the design from that high level programming language to how it gets translated to the assembly of the computer. And that's what's going on here. Cool. OK. So let's do another one. Yeah? All right. So this time, you're asked to write a data structure that implements the list ADT. But this time, you're going to be asked to store the history of a bank customer's transactions. And I will say in this one, you know, things to think about, like, you're probably only ever going to add transactions. We don't usually go back in history and, like, delete memory, right? Like, we want this sort of, like, ongoing historical record. But we do probably want to be able to review and retrieve that stuff over time. And I will say, now that I've talked about the memory piece of it, I know I keep saying, like, with, with linked lists, we're always forward. But you know what? Feel free to talk about the different ways that you would redesign a linked list. Maybe you want a back pointer. Maybe you want a front pointer. Maybe you want to do a linked list. How would you change the array? There's no wrong answers. Yeah? So everyone, go ahead. Let's take, uh, let's take four minutes. Discuss with the people around you. TAs, please feel free to move around. And we'll come back together. And I'm going to change the Slido thing so you can vote again. And we'll debate again. Go ahead. Go. Let me just change the slide
All right, take another like 30 seconds. 30 seconds of debate. All right, let's see, let's see where the votes landed. All right, show results. Oh, interesting. This one is a little like, I honestly, I think this one's a little more evenly matched. So let's start with our, our more popular options. Anyone want to raise their hand and tell me why they picked linked list for this? Apparently 54% of you did. So anyone want to tell me one of the reasons they picked linked list? Yes, I love that. So we also, when we're thinking about these designs, right, like we call that pointer at the beginning the front, but you can decide whether you add to the back or you add to the front. And so if you think of the front as sort of always pointing to the most recent transaction, I think this is a really good insight from our friend, right? Like, when I look at my bank transactions, I'm usually looking at the most recent ones. So I'm probably only like looping through those first few ones. You know, it's nice, I gotta have the history. Maybe I go back in and try and find some weird stuff way deeper, but I'm probably like living off of those first few ones there. So link list makes it really nice to sort of like just loop over those first few ones. Versus in the array situation, it would be really hard to like add to the front. We'd have to keep shifting and shifting, right? Yeah, yes, other pieces? Yes? Ah. Like, like what if we just decided index zero is not the most recent in history, index zero is the beginning of history, and we just think of uh, size minus one as the most recent history. Another totally valid way to redesign that. It's up to you. Absolutely. You could totally reinterpret it that way. For the same reason. Yes. Any other, other justifications for a linked list maybe that came up? Yeah. Yes, so we know with bank, I know for me, my bank transaction history grows faster than I wish it would, and it grows really fast. So, and it's going to grow a lot over time, right? And so maybe the linked list has that more flexibility of adding new things quickly. We're not necessarily incurring that double and like copy thing, everything over quite so often. So I think that's also a little bit more flexibility there, which is nice. Any other linked list justifications? Does anyone want to vote for array? Why do we pick array in this context? Anyone? Yeah, sure. Mm. Yes. Yeah, like if we think that like traditionally we pick link lists for that flexibility, this is a situation where we should never be reordering the history. So that's not really a benefit we care about, but maybe, you know, like I have some type of filter that wants to go in and look at all of my credits, you know, and maybe that's at different moments in time and I want to dive into those indices of the array, totally. Other choices for array? Any other justifications? Yeah, sure. Ooh, yeah, like that piece that we sort of mentioned before where, I, you know, like when we double the array, we never really shrink it back down. And so sometimes that can be a little annoying. Like if I do removes, then I have more excess memory. But in this, you're right. Hopefully, again, we're not deleting bank transactions unless something shady is going on. So since we know we're always going to be growing, the array list grows pretty well. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. Ooh, what if we mix? Do you have any suggestions for how you might want to mix it? So you were saying that every time you double it, it's like kind of like a capsule. Yeah. Like that. So maybe you keep everything in the link list, so you know you have enough to pick up all the double things. And then you just do like a transfer from the link to the array? 
fascinating. Yes, theoretically, we could do that. And I will tell you, that's an interesting way to think because guess what? After this week, we're going to learn more and more structures. And very quickly, you are going to find that most of the other data structures are a menagerie of arrays and linked lists. And, you know, like we're going to have a hash table that's technically a collection of linked lists with an AVL hanging off of the end of it. And so we are going to move in that direction. So I like where your head is at. Again, it's all about picking the right tools out of your toolbox. So I think that's an interesting one. OK, in the interest of time, we're going to dive back in. Um, I'm not, I don't think those are so interesting. Um, but hopefully you see a little bit now, when I'm talking about design decisions, what I'm looking for all, from all of you is to take a much closer look at your code, to really think about like what are the implications of what your code is doing. How does it impact the runtime? How does it impact the memory? Which functions are you optimizing for? What do you think the user needs the most? Does the user care the most about their favorite operation being super fast? Or do we want to make sure we protect the user from ever getting a really bad runtime? It's all on the spectrum. And hopefully by the end of these 10 weeks, you'll have a lot of language even some math to justify whatever you need to justify in that engineering design meeting, because I wish I could say that corporate America rewards the best dev, but they do not. They reward those who win the arguments. <laughs> so um, in our last little bit of time here, I do have some slides about how the array versus node implementation applies to other ADTs I expect you to be familiar with. I don't have enough time to really go into these in too much detail, so these are mostly like review for you. But the same sort of general policies apply. So remember, the stack, there's my little lunch trays. The stack is first in, first out. So I think of it as sort of like a, you know, like a cup maybe, <laughs> or like a, a basket where you're always sort of living off of the very top of it kind of thing like yeah maybe I have a basket for my laundry in my room and let's be real I'm always you know putting down that sweatshirt and picking that sweatshirt back up off the top and who knows what's crusty and down in the bottom that doesn't get as much love right that's our stack situation um, and so you can see some animations in here of how you would implement a stack with the array it's similar to when our friends suggested like using the back of the array as the front. That's kind of the situation. So when we push three, it goes into index zero. We push four, it goes into index one. When we pop, we pop off from the size minus one location. And then we can fill it back up again. And you can see what's nice then is pop, peak, size, is empty, is all constant. Um, but we can incur that linear resize situation because we always have that issue with arrays. So all those things we were talking about with having to resize applies for pretty much anything we use an array as an underlying structure for. Uh, same thing with nodes. Really nice and easy if we just sort of use the front pointer to be the top of the stack. Then we just sort of like add nodes in there and pop them off kind of thing. And so then again, we get constant time all the way through. We never have to do that sort of linear. So you'll find actually stacks quite often are implemented with linked lists because they are really well suited to that type of thing. Um, you can read these, but the one that I think is uh, most important for you, I put these slides after each one, but uh, stack, that's how the undo feature is implemented. It's a stack. So every time you take an action in PowerPoint, they push that action into the stack, and whenever you hit that undo button, it's a pop off the stack. Um, the other thing they use stacks for is like matching curly braces or matching tags. Every time you hit an open sort of tag, you push it into the stack. And then every time you hit a closing one, you pop off the stack and check that they match. It's a really common interview question. Um, and then queues. I'm sorry, I know I'm going fast. Like I said, I sort of expect you to be familiar with these ADTs. Um, but here's another implementing the queue with the array. We add. We add to the back. We add to the back. And then we remove from the front. Now here's the situation that's weird about queues. Now I've got empty space both at the front and the back of the array. So we do this thing called the wraparound. Uh, and where what we're going to do with the queue implementation is we are going to have two different variables. Instead of just size, we have front and back. And we add until they cross. When they cross, that's when we know we need to make a new array and copy everything over. Another very popular interview question, implement a queue with an array.
Any questions there? That's kind of like the fun, the fun, tricky one in this set here. But otherwise, same problems of sort of apply, round a space, make a new one, shifting things, so on and so forth. Um, and so you can imagine too, with the queue, we have again a front and back pointer, so on and so forth. Great. Um, okay. You know what? Maybe we'll save that for Monday. Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much for your spirited debate. I really appreciate all of your engagement. Please come back Monday. I will remind you briefly about dictionaries, and then we're going to learn about asymptotic analysis. Yay, it's the math time. Get ready for the proofs. Huzzah. Have a great weekend.